great pleasure uh, to be at the research seminar today where we have two um, brilliant speakers. Um, so uh, you'll see today's February the 27th. Uh, we're two days away from uh, Rare Disease Day on February the 29th. Um, originally, I think, selected because it is a rare day and this is a leap year. Um, we'll have uh, a lot of um, uh, information, some podcasts, etc., going out. Um, I've helped with one of them uh, that Julia Vitarello has hosted uh, with um, Rich Scott and I, um, and there'll be quite a few things coming out, so to keep, do keep an eye out. Um, so at Genomics England, I'm clinical lead for rare disease research, and I'm also an honorary consultant in clinical genetics at uh, Adam Brooks in Cambridge. Um, could you move the slide, Sam, please? Thank you. Um, so I'm really delighted that we have um, Professor Claire Shovelin uh, today um, talking about uh, uh, a super important area of trying to integrate genomics and transcriptomics to derive new insights into MAPK pathways and inhibitor efficacies in hereditary and sporadic vasculopathies. Um, and we have uh, Magdalena Bletzer talking um, at half past about the functionality and activity of human endogenous retrovirus K. Um, the next slide, please. Brilliant. Um, I've been asked to flag um, the new uh, research network communities. Um, I'm sure that uh, the team would be really happy to take um, any questions. Uh, you can nominate yourself um, or someone else to become a community co-lead. Um, obviously, research doesn't necessarily fit neatly into each of these uh, categories. It's completely fine, obviously, to have research that span these. Um, and please do ask um, questions if that would be helpful. Um, next slide. Um, so again, these are a few different blogs in rare disease and in cancer. We've um, been putting together a sort of genomics 101 series that people can go to for different, uh, broken down into different elements. Um, and there's also um, a two part blog about uh, identifying tumor specific um, mutations in case they're of interest. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so next month, there'll be another seminar and again, flagging these um, in case they are of interest to people and do spread the word. Thank you. So, um, Professor Claire Shovelin, thank you very much for coming to um, talk today. Um, so uh, Claire is a professor of clinical and molecular medicine at Imperial College in London and co-leads the NIHR uh, Imperial BRC's social genetic and environmental determinants of health theme, which is, is huge. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear uh, your talk today. Um, and um, I know you've um, really focused on integrating um, both genomics and novel, um, very clinically translatable questions for patient impact. So thank you very much. So thank you, Annalisa. Can I just check that everybody can hear me? And actually, I should also say um, it'd be brilliant if people put, could put their questions specifically in the Q&A and we'll have five minutes at the end for um, questions and I'll read them out. Um, and then again, just to flag, we've, the, the format of these seminars is now a one hour slot for the two talks. Over to you, Claire. Thank so, you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to Genomics England for asking me to speak at this uh, seminar series. Um, and before I start, I, I would like to just really congratulate and thank Genomics England, the current and the prior uh, teams for setting up such a, a, a wonderful uh, platform where we can ask not only the initial questions that we thought were difficult to address in the first place, but now being able to uh, allowing us to test so much more complex information. And it's very, very uh, valuable. So um, as you've heard, uh, I'm Claire Shovelin. I, I work at Imperial College London. Um, I used to chair the uh, respiratory GSIP for four years, and I've also uh, chaired the uh, European Reference Network for one of these vasculopathies until Brexit. Um, I do have an important declaration that's relevant to the talk. Imperial College has submitted um, a, 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 on, on MEK inhibition in relation to HHT uh, a patent application, so uh, that is relevant. So I was asked to speak to this particular um, uh, uh, paper that we published just at the end of last year. And I thought rather than speaking to it with respect to one particular 
uh, condition, it would be better to broaden the um, broaden the uh, topic, uh, which is why I've come up with this particular title. So we're not we're looking at both hereditary and sporadic vasculopathies, and many people are interested in these, and particularly thinking about the MAP kinase pathways and inhibitor efficacies. And this is relevant to anybody from pharma who may be on online. So um, starting off, what we're talking about are conditions that are non-malignant, but benign vascular malformations affecting different parts of the circulation. They may include different uh, two different combinations. I've shown there an arteriovenous malformation um, by position. Most of the conditions are recognized by skin lesions, um, some of which can be very disfiguring. Uh, obviously, we have one famous individual there. Um, and these have present in one set of circumstances. There's a different condition, which I've been specializing on for many years, where the skin lesions are, are visible, but not very prominent. People have these on their lips and their fingertips. Um, and for this condition, HHT, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, um, the main problems that people have are not disfiguring skin lesions, but instead nosebleeds from having these blood vessels in their noses leading to anemia, and then internal arteriovenous malformations, particularly in the lungs, uh, the liver and the brain. So what the European clinical management groups tell us is that these fall into two distinct classes. Um, the first group on the left um, are overseen by a working group called VASCA. They cover 42 diseases. Um, and encompassing all different parts of the circulation. But in this same European reference net network, there is a separate working group, Vasco and HHT, that simply covers HHT. And the reason they are so distinct is because of the different vascular uh, abnormalities that are commonly present and the diverse clinical phenotypes. So whereas the um, Clinicians who are involved in VASCA and VASCA on the left are generally derived from dermatology, pediatrics, plastic surgery, in addition to clinical genetics. The clinicians over on the right are more likely to be ENT surgeons, uh, general internal physicians, respiratory or neurolo neurological or, or gastrointestinally orientated and hematology. So very disparate groups of conditions um, from the, how they appear. The other thing just to point out is the difference in prevalence. So HHT is very common, affects at least one in 6,000 people, whereas many of the other diseases are very rare with as few as six new cases a year across the whole of the European Union. And this points us in the direction of their genetic causes. So for this group, um, from the very earliest work by uh, Mika Bikula, Laurent Spoon and John Mulliken in the 1990s, the uh, disease-causing genes have all mapped into RAS mitogen-activated protein kinase or MAP kinase pathways. Now, that's quite a complex um, map. I just want to remind you from a more simple view that we, we usually see um, that we're talking about the, um, the condition, the, the, the pathway that is overactivated to cause many uh, tumors, many human cancers, and indeed has been targeted for uh, inhibition with, uh, with a number of uh, different drugs over the years. So when we look at the pathway in relation to these non-HHT vascular malformation syndromes, I was able to map every one of them that I was aware of to this particular um, uh, cake pathway. Um, as you can see, highlighted around the around the, the the perimeter. To look at them in more detail, these are the uh, different groups of variants. Some of which are being identified through the hundred thousand genomes project. Um, the genes on the left um, are separated into two groups: those where the genes encode pathway activators. And in these genes, the relevant variants, pathogenic variants, whether they arise somatically or through the germline, 
are activated variants, activated pathogenic variants, whereas the second group of genes encode pathway inhibitors. And for these, the pathogenic variants are the loss of function. There are obviously multiple different, different examples. These occur usually specifically in endothelial cells, though some are associated with tumor states. So that's the, um, the, the uh, non-HHT vascular malformation syndrome genes. HHT is mechanistically distinct. It's not just clinically distinct. Um, here, I have mapped the HHT genes to the pathway. In other words, there are none. The HHT genes map to a completely separate pathway. Uh, this is the uh, signaling pathways for uh, bone morphogenetic proteins and transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta uh, family members. And HHT is caused by a heterozygous loss of function variant in one of four different genes in this pathway. Now, the genes are encode proteins which are very interesting. Endoglin normally captures the ligand BMP9 from the uh, circulation and presents it to ALK1, the type 1 receptor, which then undergoes a conformational change to signal to, to bind to the type 2 receptor and signal downstream in the canonical pathway through SMADS. And in HHT, all of the different types of loss of function variants that you would expect to see led by the frame shift and the nonsense variants, but also missense variants and others, they're all observed as you would expect. The first three genes are shown there. And more recently, I should flag that uh, GDF2 encoding BMP9 was identified as an HHT causal gene through the 100,000 Genomes uh, Project. Um, and I hope you can see all of the references below the screen. So we've spent um, a, a lot of time, including through the 100,000 Genomes Project, looking at molecular mechanisms that contribute to HHT variability looking for uh, modifier genes, and also separately looking at mutational subtypes, uh, particularly through transcriptomics. Now, for the modifier genes, uh, we published a couple of years ago in Blood Advances that bleeding is more severe if, by chance, people have uh, high-impact variants in genes that affect coagulation and platelet function. Uh, very recently, we've published some pharmacogenomic genes and we've also have separate uh, work looking at mutational subtypes. This is for the uh, distinction for the premature termination codon inducing uh, variants and also uh, missense variants. The reason I'm showing you these is that not one of these avenues has taken us towards the MAPK pathway. So while we've been looking extensively, we have not been able to identify any modifier genes that are in that pathway. Um, and we, we, we mentioned that in the, the recent paper. So we have no genes from HHT or modifier genes that map to the pathway, but we do have a drug because bevacizumab, um, which is a monoclonal antibody to vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, VEGF, is an effective treatment for many people with HHT, and this uh, blocks the, uh, the pathway upstream. Um, so this raises the question of what's going on? Is it, do we arm wave and say HHT matters most when angiogenesis is happening? Well, we can, of course, do that, but can we be more scientific? Um, and we've made um, an unexpected contribution to this uh, discussion. Um, and this brings me to the paper I was asked to, to speak to. So to get us started, we've got to go back to lockdown. I'm sure you all remember those dreadful days when we weren't allowed to see anybody and clinics all moved online. So I was running um, a teleclinic for people with HHT. Um, I had a standard set of questions I would ask every clinic. And one particular person came came uh, came on online and told me what they were what they were experiencing. And they didn't mention their nosebleeds, so I said, "Oh, so how are the nosebleeds?" Um, to be told that actually they didn't have nosebleeds anymore. So, at which I was quite surprised because I didn't think ENT uh, surgeons were particularly operational during COVID. And they said, "No, they hadn't had any ENT surgery." Um, instead, uh, they had taken a new drug for their cancer and they thought this might be responsible. So in the clinic, I did a quick Google search, saw what the drug was and thought this might be interesting. So I'd just like to take you through the next steps. 
this, first of all, is uh, um, giving you an overview of how bad the nosebleeds are for people with HHT. There are some people with none, but in these, the first 202 people that I uh, reviewed and I published more than a decade ago, about one in four have nosebleeds at least once a day. And similar proportions are taking um, are iron, um, in, more, in fact, greater proportions are taking iron and many are transfusion dependent. And pre-COVID, this is where this individual had been sitting at the highest, in the highest groups. And this is where they were telling me they were uh, on that teleclinic appointment. So a, a change that I have not seen before uh, without uh, intervention. And this was the drug they were taking, uh, a MEK1 inhibitor, trametinib, um, which blocks the uh, penultimate step of that pathway um, and has been developed along with many other MEK inhibitors uh, to, to block the pathway. And obviously there are many other uh, active pharmaceutical agents further that, that uh, uh, operate elsewhere in that pathway. So the importance from that quick Google search was, of course, that I realized this was downstream from Bevacizumab, which was also already known to be effective. And the question really was, why? If HHT was an autosomal recessive condition requiring loss of the second allele, it would be very easy to explain. And that is because the um, this pathway, um, if completely blocked, takes the breaks off MAP kinase signaling. So if people completely lost their this pathway, then you could understand that the pathway would be overactive. And there is evidence for somatic loss of the second allele in HHT vascular lesions. Doug Marching's group have pioneered this work, but it has since been taken forward by many other international HHT groups. And so that would fit, except it is incredibly low level by allelic loss usually in the order of 1% to 2%. The mean in, in, in Dan's paper was 1.7%. So we're really not sure that that is causal. And on the other hand, we have existing data from Michel Letart's lab showing that there's approximately 50% endoglin protein expression in both the AVMs and the normal blood vessels from people who are heterozygous for endoglin frame shift variants. The other thing that I should share is this re very recent data from Valeria Orlova and uh, Christine Mumry's groups emphasizing how remarkably normal endothelial cells are when derived directly from HHT patients. They were able to take advantage of an individual who was a mosaic for uh, an HHT causal variant in the, HHT, in the endoglin gene, and they separately derived isoglycine what are isogenic iPSCs, but one one set had the endoglin uh, mutation, the other were, were wild type. And what they were able to show was that in normal assays, in all the 2D functional assays we usually do, there was absolutely no difference between these isogenic lines. And they needed to expose endothelial cells to further stresses growing in 3D to expose differences. So we really do have a very well compensated set of endothelial cells when we're talking about, about this condition. The other important concept is that SMAD4 signaling is absolutely essential in early development. Um, it's it, you couldn't just look at all of the the various uh, null uh, mice to to be to be certain of this, and this got me thinking: is in HHT, how does that compensation work? Are pathway inhibitors being reduced? So that despite the fact that the signaling is reduced, that overall signaling, because of the, 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 the loss of function alleles, um, is it being maintained that way? Or are there alternate pathway activators? Now, fortunately, I was able to address this because in a collaborative work with Michaela Aldred at the University of Indiana, we have been deriving blood outgrowth endothelial cells from people with HHT and controls and had already performed RNA-seq and pulse chase. And in fact, this paper, the first author's Maria Bernabo Herrera, has just been accepted for blood. So you'll be able to read the full story in due course. But the importance for the, the current uh, presentation is that I was able to look at the RNA-seq data from HHT-derived uh, blood outgrowth endothelial cells and controls. 
And the first thing I looked at was whether the pathway inhibitors were reduced. Um, there, is a there are beautiful data sets of, part of uh, moieties that inhibit these signaling pathways. I've given you one of the, the core papers there. And every single one of those uh, inhibitors was down in at least one of the HHT uh, BOEX sets. I think there are nine or 10 shown in the actual paper. I've shown three here. So we definitely have evidence that at least at an RNA transcript level, inhibitors are reduced. The harder question was about alternate pathway activators. And here I had to go back to very old literature um, because it's many decades, in fact, since people were really thinking about the, 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 the pathways in this sort of way. So I flipped around the PubMed searches and looked up a few um, key names from, the, from that period and found that Mike Gimbroni and his colleagues had identified back in 1999 that um, a protein that was a member of um, a stress-activated pathway could selectively activate SMAD2-mediated uh, um, transcription in, in endothelial cells. And this protein was encoded by MAP3K1. We, I therefore checked, and it, no matter how the RNA-seq data were normalized, be it to total library reads, specific housekeeper genes, or a panel of housekeeper genes, um, this transcript was always higher in the HHT uh, BOEX. And furthermore, it was the only one of the MAP3 kinase genes that was increased in HHT BOEX. There are a huge number of these, and as you can see, these are there. These are shown here. So our working models can be somewhat extended from where we, we were a, a couple of years ago. We've known for some time that HHT endothelial cells compensate for their genetic defect, um, unless there are second or third hits and discussion goes on as to what those hits would be. Um, we can add to this that we think this is when inhibiting MAP kinase pathway signaling probably becomes more important. Um, and that that's when our uh, agents such as bevacizumab and trametinib are likely to play more roles. And I think this is a very important concept, not just for the science and the, 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 the clinical care, but also for drug development, because I'd point out that HHT, because of its bleeding phenotypes and anemia, offers really uh, very uh, precise outcome measures for clinical trials. Um, we don't just need to look at actual vascular malformations regressing. We have a number of uh, really important clinical endpoints. So we expect to see a lot of more work in this space. So it just leaves me to thank uh, the members of my own group who've been, um, I've, whose work I've presented today, uh, key collaborators, particularly Michaela Aldred, the University of Indiana, though there are a number of other really important collaborators listed on this slide. Our funders, um, NHS colleagues, particularly at Imperial and West London, though more broadly in the UK, um, and the patients, their families, and everybody at Genomics England. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That was fascinating um, and uh, yeah, brilliant to have a therapy as well. <laughs> um, that's, um, so I can't see any questions yet, and I, I'm sure there must be um, questions. So please do um, pop them in the Q&A uh, box. There are lots and lots and lots of clapping. Um, so I'll start whilst people think and type questions. So the, I guess that the the topic of variability, variable expression, is 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 so fascinating, and um, I think it, at least in the genetics clinic, and sometimes seeing families with young children, um, it, it's it's a really hard um, counselling conversation because you 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 don't know, and we're so bad at predicting who's actually going to be mildly affected, severely affected. Um, I don't know from your work if there's anything. Else, you've obviously been talking about, you mentioned genomic modifiers. Um, yeah, I'd really be interested to know what, where you think this might lead and will we have a better understanding? Are there other 
potential modifiers and environmental yeah. factors, etc. Well, we, we have a, a large body of work on environmental modifiers, which we do uh, uh, address in clinic. But I think the, the first point you point you, you bring up is so important, the predictive elements. When you've diagnosed particularly a young person, a child or a young person, and they're looking at their family saying, um, that, you know, granddad had a terrible time with this or my auntie had a terrible time. I think it's really important to emphasize that people within the same families are so different that they shouldn't be thinking what happened to an older family member is going to happen to me. And I think that element is really important. Works both ways. There can be some very, very healthy older family members, and that doesn't mean that the youngster is going to be so healthy. Um, and then it, there are some simple measures that we can, we can take. It would, it would be another another topic but uh, there are uh, there are many things that can be done but it, it, we are we are moving towards that now with evidence including from the endothelial cells so uh, you'd have to have me back in a, in a few yeah I, I, I would love to hear more and I think it is such a yeah it's such an important area yeah. for patients and as you say it works both ways in some senses yes. the more severe patients come to clinic and on the other hand sometimes you're seeing Yes, children who you just don't know if they're going to be as affected. Or, um, and I also loved uh, your example about um, the patient who said, "Who said, well, my nose? You know, when you asked that my nosebleeds are so much better, and could it be this drug? I mean, it's an amazing sort of example of um, listening to what patients uh, uh, are telling you. I don't know whether you have any other such light bulb. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Moments so, uh, that, um, so, yes. You want to so, share. so, yes. So the one that really surprised me, I, I, I went into HHT, not because of HHT per se, but because of pulmonary arterial venous malformations. Um, okay. And but I, I knew I needed to hear about I needed to correct iron deficiency anemia. And so I was asking people very early in my experience, you know, what about you know, what iron tablets do you take? The first thing was that lots of people said, I can't take them. And so yeah. although their doctors thought they were taking iron, they really weren't. But then um, a very big uh, message that came through from about one in 20 people, which we subsequently quantified, was that many people taking the iron tablets that were meant to be helping them could sometimes aggravate their nosebleeds. And this is a very difficult mm -hmm. concept, which we've uh, been looking uh, in the periphery at for a number of years. Um, and there are the, the, the standard uh, message I give to people is if you find something that is making your own nosebleeds uh, worse, then it's up to you. But even if there's no evidence in, in, the, in the general literature, you might want to make some changes. We've done that for dietary advice as well. We leave it to people to make their own decisions because we, uh, if there's no evidence, um, but also encourage people to look and consider for themselves. Uh, they, they, they're very, very wise observers. Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll suggest that if people think of questions that they type them in the box and Claire, if you're staying on, you might be I'll willing to, to, I'll, to, I'll, to answer. I'll, I'll Thank you so much. Uh, we really enjoyed that. Um, so I will uh, now introduce Dr. Magda Bletzer, um, who will uh, talk about the functionality and activity of human endogenous retrovirus K. Um, so um, Magda is a postdoctoral researcher at the Hellenic Pasteur Institute in Greece um, and also holds a position at the National and Kapodistrian University of um, Athens. Um, originally, she did her PhD in uh, KU Leuven in Belgium on the molecular epidemiology of HIV and hepatoviruses. Um, so I confess that I know very little about viral ecology and evolution, but I'm fascinated to, um, to hear about it. And particularly, I think you study these evolutionary processes and dynamics in relation to um, uh, pathogen genomic diversity. So thank you so much for coming to talk today. And please do pop questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annalisa, for uh, the very nice uh, introduction. So indeed, I am uh, um, a virus genomics person, so um, I have expertise in that. But uh, the last two years, I became quite interested in um, uh, virus integrations in vertebrate genomes. And um, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about our research at uh, uh, the Genomics England. So I'll share. 
my slides. So normally you see the monitor and it should be in the presenter's mode uh, now. Is it fine? Okay, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will uh, talk about our uh, work on the Genomics England and try to address or, or try to give you the rationale of how we aim to address some important questions about the functionality and activity of human endogenous retrovirus K. So um, just a little bit uh, uh, an overview uh, of my talk before moving into the specifics. I'll start with a brief introduction of uh, what are the human endogenous retroviruses and why they do matter. I will continue with uh, the rationale of our project and the pipeline we have developed. And finally, we'll present some uh, preliminary findings and how we can potentially assess whether a particular endogenous retrovirus is actively proliferating in modern humans. But uh, before, before moving to my talk and before diving, diving into the world of endogenous retroviruses, I would uh, like to, to give a brief introduction about the concept of EVES, which stands for endogenous viral elements. So in brief, these are viral fragments that have been integrated into chromosomes and after that have been inherited as host alleles. Such uh, genomics integra genomic integrations uh, may be mediated by either non-homologous recombination with chromosomal DNA or by interactions with uh, cellular retroelements. Uh, therefore, uh, EVEs are quite interesting uh, because they do reflect long-term virus host interactions and can be very useful for reconstructing deep, uh, the, the deep history of virus and uh, host evolution. In, uh, uh, in animal genomes, the majority of EVEs are derived from RNA viruses, mostly known are uh, integrated flaviviruses, pestiviruses, and retroviruses, and uh, they integrated through various processes. Uh, all these uh, uh, here, I depict uh, the four different group of RNA viruses that are integrated into host genomes, and all these viruses must produce mRNA in order to express their proteins. However, uh, the, the steps between entry into the cell and the expression of mRNA vary quite a lot. And uh, uh, the highlighted group here in red, retroviruses, are quite unique because they are the only animal viruses that integrated into the host genome as an obligate step in their replication strategy. And therefore, they are predisposed to enter the host germline. And a couple of things about uh, uh, the retrovirus life cycle. So um, during infection, retroviruses enter host cells and they convert their RNA genomes to DNA by reverse transcription. After that, the DNA copy of the viral genome enters the cell nucleus and integrates into the host genome. That enables expression of uh, viral genes via the host cellular machinery to produce more viruses. And um, occasionally, this integration can occur in the germline, in a germline cell, which allows the retroviral insert insertion to be vertically inherited. So uh, now, what are essentially the herbs or Herbs, which see, stands for human endogenous retroviruses. These are insertions of either full length a retroviral genome or um, partial uh, retroviral genome in the human genome. And such integration resulted from um, uh, an ancient retroviral infection that occurred in the germline cells of our primate ancestors about 450 million years ago. Herbs uh, 
are known to account for about 8% of the human genome and um, uh, are mainly defective for viral expression. For viral expression. So today, uh, the only hair which is known to have proliferated in the human genome is uh, uh, the human endogenous retrovirus K, or else HML2, which exists in about 1,000 copies, with 90 of those uh, being full-length proviruses and the rest solo LTRs. And this is supposed to, con to constitute the most recent uh, and re retrovirus insertion. But uh, why, why do they matter? So hairs are, uh, are involved in various biological processes through encoding proteins, or they can act as promoters and cancers, or uh, long non-coding RNAs to affect uh, human health and disease. Upregulated expression of um, uh, hairs has been associated with innate immunity. A lot of papers have also shown that they do uh, play a role in um, oncology and uh, the majority of the literature um, discusses potential implications in neurological disorders. So we, we are interested in trying to um, find, investigate their precise role and uh, whether and there is any potential germline activity of those HML2 endogenous viruses. So moving on to the next part, I will uh, briefly discuss our work on the 100,000 genomes and uh, uh, give you some preliminary findings. So where we wanted, uh, so in our project, we wanted to design and implement the bioinformatics pipeline for the discovery of novel polymorphic HML2 insertion. This, uh, this would help us to deeply analyze a target data set of 10,000 genomes and describe their present day frequency. And by doing all these, we aim to address the following fundamental questions about uh, public health. So how many novel and also previously described HML2 insertions are found in modern humans. At which chromosomal lo uh, loci are those integrated? Uh, also, what is the present day frequency of these rare insertions in the human population? And uh, on top of that, we are also considering as a separate project to try to um, find any associations of those rare HML2 insertions with maybe a particular rare disease. Since uh, we are interested in estimating the frequency of uh, uncatalogued HML2 germline integrations, we only focus on mining the fraction of genomes obtained from families with germline rare diseases. Uh, and based on the 15th uh, data release, we have compiled a data set consisting of about 12,000 genomes of the rare diseases families. And uh, from those uh, genomes, we have subselected a data set of 10,000 genomes to screen. And uh, uh, a couple of things of our discovery uh, pipeline. So we split our work on two main parts. The first part is uh, uh, the step where we try to see whether we have any insertions in uh, the genomes and then the part, the second part where we try to annotate those insertions. So starting from um, the, the BAM files, we utilize MELT and uh, uh, MELT searches for uh, areas or uh, regions with lower sequencing depth and uh, tries to find discordant or split reads. And MELT needs a reference genome in order to uh, map those discordant and split reads. And this reference genome, in a, reference genome in our case is the LTR sequence from HERP-K113, which is uh, considered the most recent endogenous uh, retrovirus. Then 
uh, I also uh, need to say that we split our work of the 10,000 genome screening into batches uh, of uh, 1,000 genomes. So then MELT uh, gives us back a VCF file where we, uh, and upon obtaining all the VCF files per batch, we merge them and we essentially have 10 merged multi VCF files. And now comes the second part of our pipeline where we uh, compare the chromosomal coordinates of those inser HML2 like insertions with known herd K and known HML2 polymorphic insertion sites. In the case that we have, uh, we have identified previously known insertion lock loci, we estimate their present day frequency and the rest of the insertions are put into a list of putative novel HML2 insertions. For those putatively novel insertions, we revisit the BAM files which uh, are produced by MELT with the HML2 alignment and uh, we manually inspect the alignment in the IGB browser. Also, we search uh, at, at the UCSC browser for any recently added annotation. And if there is no record, we extract the reads supporting the breakpoint and uh, blast the reads against the herd K113 LTR sequencing in order to see whether this is a novel retrovirus insertion. Now, um, we have done that for uh, uh, 5,000 genomes, and uh, we have managed to identify 26 dynastic loci, which are distributed across 13 chromosomes. Although um, those insertions are not included in the human reference genome, they have been previously described by Will Sude and colleagues in 2016 on a data set of 2,500 uh, genomes. And um, interestingly, unfixed HML2 insertions have, been, have not been detected in eight chromosomes, but uh, so far there is no sound hypothesis uh, for, uh, for this evidence. As for uh, their frequency, uh, we observe that it ranges quite a lot among the insertion loci. This goes from the most frequent insertions, especially this one in chromosome 15 with more than 88% of the genome screened having this insertion, down to some ultra, ultra rare um, HML2 insertions with less than 0.1% frequency. Uh, previous studies, the frequency of um, fixed HML2 insertions have identified a relatively similar pattern, the major differences being the chromosomal loci with low frequency insertion, especially those uh, that are less than 10%. In addition to that, I do highlight here uh, two insertion loci in, uh, in red that have been previously detected only in African population, but now we have also estimated their frequencies in a mostly European data set. And uh, I wish to, to be able to share with you more findings, but uh, this is a relatively uh, recent project and we have started uh, now trying to understand the results of our analysis. So uh, the conclusions are actually very uh, straightforward, very just only two things that we have an identified 26 insertion loci across certain chromosomes. We have um, estimated their present ranging from less than 0.1% to more than 88%. And uh, we have not found any novel HML2 insertion after screening um, half of our data set, target data set. Uh, of course, as a, as a future objective, we, we aim to finish the analysis on the remaining 5,000 genomes. And um, an idea is that it might be interesting to search for other herbs or maybe non-retroviral EVs 
in the same data set. So at this point, I would, uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation and uh, I would like to point out our funding sources and uh, thank them for their support. And of course, thank you very much for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, I learned several things. <laughs> um, that's, that's very good to know, very good. <laughs> um, so um, please do put questions, big or small, um, in the uh, Q&A box. We, we do have five or 10 minutes if, we, uh, if, if people would like for discussion. So, so, so please feel free. Um, so, uh, and I'll start with one very quick question. Um, I, and, I, and I might have missed this, sorry, was the, how did you select initially those 5,000 and then the subsequent 5,000? I guess I'm coming at it from the rare disease angle um, and thinking about whether you, you might, you know, be, be trying to find um, very rare insertions that might actually, you know, might be linked with the being a cause for a rare condition. And I was wondering how those 5,000 or 10,000 were, were initially selected. Yeah, so uh, we did split the work in batches to be able to, to process those samples because uh, a very important step of the pipeline and uh, for identifying endogenous uh, viral elements in general is to uh, manually curate and have a visual uh, uh, and check the visual alignments for uh, a good quality mapping. So because this is impossible to be performed um, um, like in very large numbers on, on a large scale, we had to split the work and it was completely, actually completely random, the selection. I mean, we just have a data set of 10,000 and uh, we just wanted uh, to be uh, like uh, all the genomes to come from the rare diseases program and germline uh, family, like a family study. And um, uh, we started actually from the oldest to the newest uh, samples being sequenced. So it was not a prioritization based on the phenotype. And do you know if it was um, probands and parents? Because I suppose quite, you know, quite a few obviously families will have a trio structure, quite a few. Exactly. Um, I, I guess I, I don't know how often these things uh, happen. <laughs> So, like, if, if if a lot of developmental disorders that are rare are caused by de novo genomic events, and I don't know again, yeah, how this would fit with the, and I might, so this might be completely on a different ballpark. But I suppose I was just thinking very simplistically that looking at probands might might tell you more in that respect than looking at parental samples. Uh, yeah, so that's that's actually a brilliant question because. Um, uh, we want families uh, trials because we want to analyze them as a as a whole, like all three, all four, all five, more, more than three. Because if later on we identify a novel HML two insertion, it might be good in the, in the proband. That's the most interesting question that would be uh, nice to have, like the most interesting scenario. If a proband has a novel insertion loci and uh, the parents do not, maybe that could be linked to the clinical phenotype. But first we wanted to do that as a large scale screening in order to see whether there is any novel insertion and then as a separate project go and actually do a targeted search of the family. Yeah. Okay. So that yeah. that is that is the idea. Yes. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting if you did find some of these ultra rare ones in probands in related genes. So then you could obviously follow through with the family structure where where possible. Um, I see we've got um, Claire uh, has asked. I don't know if you can see this as well. You mentioned the twenty six new loci insertions are not in the reference genome. Uh, did you mean HD thirty eight? Can you see the question? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire, for the question. So, yeah, they they are not in the reference. Of, uh, they are not in any of uh, the human reference genomes because um, they are actually unfixed in the uh, human genome. So those are quite polymorphic. So even in the T2T assembly, which we still have to 
thoroughly check. I mean, we we're now using the the human genome 38 version, but we still have to check uh, thoroughly the T2T assembly. Uh, it will be difficult to add this polymorphic uh, those polymorphic loci because that would mean that would assume that most of the people do have that. But yeah, with these kind of frequencies, I think it makes sense for the high frequent ones to be present in the reference. But so far, they are still not included. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> and presumably makes more, mm -hmm. more yeah, work. Because, hmm. Yeah, because uh, there are no studies so far with uh, like, like what we are uh, trying to do here with uh, a very large number of genomes print and estimating the modern day frequency. And because the ultra rare, rare integrations does not make sense to be in the reference genome. I mean, those are super rare events. But for the high frequency ones, I think that uh, that would be something that, uh, yeah, we might uh, consider including at some point. I, I don't know if it would be possible either within the data set using um, probands versus sort of effectively controls, which could be the parents or something else, or whether one could compare. I don't know if there's work um, looking at other sort of population databases and saying, are there differences in the um, presence of insertions in a patient database versus a, a sort of control data set? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, actually. Um, anyway, that was fascinating. Um, if, um, if anybody has any other questions, please do um, put them in the Q&A. Um, I think these, uh, from my perspective, were really interesting sort of complementary talks, one coming very much from the patient in front of you and then building out to you know, wow, a sort of therapy and understanding the underlying biology. Um, and in your case, going from the genome and seeing, can we study these really rare evolutionary sort of quite incredible uh, events um, and how, yeah, and how they may actually relate to, to the patient. It'll be fascinating to, to hear more in future. Um, it, it made me also uh, want to just flag that we're always trying to improve our clinical research uh, interface and in rare diseases is particularly important linking clinicians and researchers and obviously a lot of our researchers are also clinicians um, and yes th th so there is a, a, a mechanism in the research environment to to flag if if one does think that one's found something that's potentially diagnostic or one's not sure yet but being in touch with the clinical team might help to ascertain so for example if one had found a rare variant or insertion and then um, does that actually fit that, that gene with the patient's phenotype, et cetera, to be able to take forward. So just again, flagging that if there are people listening who um, that might apply to, and we know that it can be uh, difficult, but we really want to try and um, help do this and connect researchers and clinicians. So um, I'd really, really like to thank both Claire and Magda for fascinating talks. Um, I hope you'll check out some of the uh, things that appear this week related to Rare Disease Day and look forward to seeing you at a future seminar. Thank you so much, Magda and Claire. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Annalisa. Thank you. Thank you all.